Marilyn, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, I, I appreciate that. There are several things that I would like to say before I begin my study this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I took a poll last week, and I apologize that some of you were not here. But we're going to be good beginning a uh, series of <coughs> studies on the at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning to start trying to build a Sunday school. Uh, and uh, that particular study will be uh, there. And I look down and see some mistakes there, but that's fine. Mistakes are not up that important. But as a result of the poll and the discussions I had with some of you, uh, we decided to start this study on the second Sunday in September. After all vacations are over, if we uh, start in uh, be at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. Uh, the studies will be videos that uh, I have collected down through the years that I think are very important. Uh, the first one that we're going to go through is called Monumental, uh, which is a tracing of the uh, Christian heritage of our nation. Uh, how the Puritans and some of the Huguenots and so forth that ever had left Europe to came to the United States. Uh, the uh, association with the Indians around Plymouth Rock and uh, all this and uh, uh, it's a very good presentation. It will take about three to four weeks to go through the video because we'll probably show a half hour and then get ready for worship service. Uh, we will have discussions involving it. The second video that we're going to see is Genesis History, uh, which I think is a very, very good uh, video concerning the uh, biblical creation and why uh, it is more scientific than what evolution is. Um, Marilyn was talking to me last week. She was wanting to have it uh, first because it, she's more interested in that. But uh, on that particular video, uh, it, is, it does show on Netflix and whether you had a chance to see it or not. But uh, uh, it is a very good presentation. I finally found a video about uh, Genesis a creation story that I agree with. I agree with almost 99% of what's presented there. So uh, we will have a good discussion with that because on the video we'll, there, will, there are some study guides and so forth. Then the last one is a 13th a week study on building on the American heritage. Again, going back to the, the fact that we are a Christian nation. Uh, we will be pushing this every Sunday uh, for the next or three weeks and so forth. The other thing that I wanted to say is that we're, let's begin this morning. We're going to be getting a four-week study of the Gospels. Uh, this will be nothing more than a survey of the various Gospels I have, that Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, when I was in college, uh, we had a professor who uh, loved to give term papers. And he told me after I, uh, as I was my senior year after I didn't have him anymore, he said, Phil, I always appreciated your turn papers. And I looked at him and said, why? He said, because you always took the opposite view of trying to present the uh, opposite view of what I was thinking of, and you always, always gave me some good arguments. So I, I appreciated that. But he ever always said, you ought to build a turn paper or any message or any study that you have about who, who when, who, where and why. And I found out that a lot of the difficult passages that you have in God's Word can be uh, resolved and understood if you use that key, who, when, why, where, uh, and why, and so forth, those five, five W's, uh, and that, uh, and so forth. Now, I'm going to give you some of the things I have used that will be able to develop these so that you will know that this is just not something that I have copied. I have used the Open Bible. Uh, by the way, the Open Bible has, uh, has a study or a survey right at the beginning of each book that uh, uh, the Bible, with the Genesis, going all the way through Revelation, it's right in that book. Uh, it is one of the best uh, studies I ever seen. And it, uh, the Open Bible, the purchase of the Open Bible, uh, would be valuable just to be able to get those uh, introductions to the service. I'm using Holly's Handbook of the Bible, uh, Nelson's Bible Dictionary, Andrew's Bible Dictionary. I use the PC Bible One Touch System. Uh, I'm using Clark's Commentary. I'm using uh, Jameson Foss and Brown, just to mention a few. 
So I'm doing a lot of study to be able to get down uh, our study on this particular thing. And all the, all the time uh, presentation that we have here will be uh, based upon uh, this particular study. Now as you have an overview of the various Gospels, uh, and one of the things that I'm thinking of as I get involved with this, is the basic idea that you have four Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I can remember those four. Uh, but there were others that were written. And one of the questions that will always come up, why were these four chosen? And all the other ones, such as the Gospel according to Mary, the Gospel according to Thomas, the Gospel according to Barnabas, and so forth. And there's a whole bunch of them. And one of the reasons why these four were chosen was the fact that they were influenced or written by an apostle. And the early church, by the end of the first century, while John the Apostle was still living, had already settled on these four as the major ones. So it was nothing more than the fact that John influence is here for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Also, as you begin to think about this, uh, the three, first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are all similar. While they get involved with more than just the idea of, uh, of, of, uh, of their particular study, uh, there is some differences. And the explanation of the differences will be based upon the background. Uh, we'll get involved with that a little bit. Uh, a little bit. But uh, Matthew comes first because it was used mainly by the early church. It seems strange that in the first and second century writings, that most of the quotations that you find from the Gospels is found in the book of Matthew. And that is one of the same reasons why Matthew comes first. These three are known as the synoptic Gospels because of their similarity. And John is a, an addition and goes involved, involves with other things besides that. But I know in the background, there, uh, there are some real interesting differences. For, for instance, Matthew approaches the birth of Christ and the genealogy of Christ on the basis of the father, Joseph. If you recall, the latter part of the first chapter deals with Joseph having an angel and dreamed about taking Mary. Then Luke takes it from the standpoint of Mary, talking about her, the angel coming and visiting her, Gabriel visiting her, and her uh, cousin uh, Elizabeth being pregnant with, uh, uh, with John the Baptist and so forth. And the genealogy is a genealogy based upon Mary's lineage. And when you, you look at this, and one of the critics of the Bible will say, why the difference? Why the difference? Very simply, is because the Jew, Matthew wrote for the Jews. And they were a patriarchal society based upon the male dominance. Uh, I'm not saying that they didn't consider a woman as important. They did because you have in the Old Testament hand in, uh, in uh, Deborah and some of the other ones. And it was a male dominance. And the Jews would have been quickly to reject Jesus as the Messiah if the approach was used to show to Mary. Mary, uh, the Greeks, the look for the Greeks or the, the, the Gentiles. And uh, as you think about that, that the Gentiles would not be concerned about that. They'd be more concerned about the love line of the throne of David. And this is why they, he approaches it through Mary. And another thing that you see in Matthew, the 24th chapter, one of the most difficult passages to, to quote, to understand simply because of the idea that many people have misinterpreted we need to realize that Matthew was writing to the Jews who were living in Jerusalem. And they will be involved with the destruction of Jerusalem. We'll get more involved with this later on. And therefore, he was warning the Jews about the destruction of Jerusalem. And Matthew, the 24th chapter, does not deal with the second coming of Christ. It deals with the destruction of Jerusalem and the overthrow of the temple. And uh, I understand that not one Christian lost their life during the Roman invasion and just destruction of Jerusalem and the overthrow of the temple simply because they saw the signs that were there 
and escaped Jerusalem and got out of the way before the, uh, they came. So that's interesting. Uh, I think the whole sum of Matthew can be summed up in the very first verse. Uh, and by the way, that first paragraph is copied. Uh, I, I would uh, make that comment. It was copied uh, from one of the, uh, I think, the Nelson's Bible Dictionary. But it uh, says the book of the, uh, Matthew begins with the book of the generation, genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Two people there are mentioned. David, the son of David, which qualifies him to be occupying the throne of David because he was uh, of that lineage. The son of Abraham, which qualifies him to be the, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, which promised to be a blessing to all nations. Now, I'm not going to go all the way down there. But it's, it's interesting. Uh, and there should be no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that uh, Matthew was the, uh, that wrote, wrote the, uh, uh, this gospel. While he is not named, he is not named. The early church writings identify him without question as being the writer of, of the book of uh, Matthew. The gospel itself does not identify that it was written by a Jew, for the Jew, about a Jew. I want you to remember that. The Matthew was written for, by a Jew, about a Jew, for the Jews. And the purpose of the book is to give the Jews an understanding that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Uh, interesting to emphasize that the, uh, uh, Matthew uses the term the kingdom of God, and that Jesus Christ is the king of the kingdom. What about the date? The date, uh, I've seen dates from, emphasized from about 35, 36 AD, uh, up through about 150 AD. Uh, my particular idea would be that it was written prior to the fall of Jerusalem. It would have to be written between the time of uh, 56 to 68 AD, 12 year period, we don't know. Matthew is identified in the book uh, as being Levi, uh, which was another name. Uh, uh, we all have uh, opinions uh, or ideas of different names. Uh, my brother was uh, known by his family, uh, myself, and some of the others as Elmer Faust. But yet, uh, for his friends and for his work, he was known as Charles Faust. His name was Charles Elmer Faust, so it's not unusual for a person to have different names. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. They were hated because they would add to the taxes in order to make their own living. And because they represented Rome, it was oppressing the people at that time. <coughs> Excuse me. We go on with this. <coughs> when Jesus called Matthew, he left all and called Jesus Christ. <coughs> Luke was known about his later life. After the beginning of the church, he seems to fade into uh, nothingness or uh, in the, if, in the traditions of that time. He is thought to have preached in uh, Jerusalem and went uh, back you know, over east into a rock and raw, uh, raw what we know as a rock and a rock, and then preached there. There are some teachings concerning Matthew that I disagree with. There are some teachings that I think are entirely wrong. Let me get involved with those. Uh, if I do nothing else besides go through this, I'm going to be satisfied. First, there is a philosophy. And I've heard this ever since I've been knee-high to a grasshopper because we had a preacher that preached it all the time in my home church in Pittsburgh. There was a philosophy that there was a book written a gospel written before Mark, who was the first of the gospel writers that we have, uh, wrote his gospel. And that book is known as Ur Mark. Uh, 
Let it be understood that there is absolutely nowhere in biblical history, secular history, nowhere that we could even begin to identify such a book. It is a philosophy of a modern thought that there had to be a common source for Matthew, Mark, and Luke in order to be able to copy their works. Now the question I come up with, why would it be necessary for Matthew, who was with Jesus all during his ministry, to have to depend on somebody else's work in order to be able to write down what he lived through and what he personally experienced? I disagree with that teaching. If you ever come across a pterodotal, your the Bible will throw it away because it's not there. It's just not there. The second, and I mentioned this earlier. There is a very popular view that Matthew 24 speaks of the second coming of Christ. Uh, I disagree with that. Lewis, some of it does, not all of it. There were three questions that the disciples asked Jesus after he spoke of that destruction. Not, oh, there won't be a stone left upon one another. And those, those three questions were, number one, when will the destruction of Jerusalem take place, the overthrow of the temple? Number two, what are the signs of your coming? And number three, when is the, the end of the world? In the mind of the disciples, they associated all three together. But Jesus answered them separately. And by the way, when Jerusalem was uh, overthrown, when the temple was built that was at the time of Jesus Christ, the in between the stones of the temple as a filling, rather than using cement, they used gold. And the temple had gold all through its structure. And when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple, the abomination of desolations was when they took the Caesar into the temple and held him as God. That was the abomination of desolation. And then they began to overthrow the temple, the stones of the temple, in order to be able to scrape out that gold and to got it among themselves. That's how why it was so destructive. Well, the end part of the Matthew 24 deals with the second coming, and the 25th chapter deals with the second coming we do find that the first part of that, which we interpret as signs of the second coming, were uh, 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 part of the answer to the throw of Jerusalem. Third, there is a, and I, uh, this bugs me, it makes me mad. Third, there is a teaching that Jesus came to establish an earthly kingdom. To overthrow Rome as the government and Jew, the Jews would become a dominant kingdom ruling all of the earth. Uh, the Jews were expecting it. The, uh, the uh, disciples even thought about it, even to after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as you think about this, the people that believe it, feel that at the end of chapter 12 of the book of Matthew, that is when Jesus changed his view of his purpose. I read a book, and I'm not sure whether it was written by Pentagon or Chaffin. I wish I still had the book. I don't know what ever happened to it. Uh, but in the book, the idea he expressed about this thought was, Jesus failed in his original purpose. Because of the rejection of the Pharisees, of the scribes, Jesus failed, and he had to go from plan A to plan B. Now, the reason I get mad about that, I cannot believe that Jesus, who was God in the flesh, would ever fail. Now, if you do, uh, then you minimize my thought of Jesus Christ. I can't see Jesus failing in his purpose for coming. I 
cannot see that Jesus would have to switch and leave because he did not anticipate the rejection by the Pharisees. I don't know that don't feel this necessary. Another teaching that is questionable that uh, is not important is the fact that uh, Matthew was written first in the Hebrew language and then later translated to Greek. I see no evidence of this. He would not sound logical. Another point that we might need to make is that we, uh, Matthew, but knowing the background of Matthew, that in fact that it was being written to the Jews, helps us to understand why the genealogies, and we've already talked about that, uh, is traced back to the throne of David. Uh, because the Jews were a patriarchal society, uh, the they father ruled. Uh, the birth of Jesus is seen through Joseph because of the emphasis of a, a patriarch art society. In other words, uh, Matthew is dealing with the legal inheritance of the throne of David that Jesus is occupying, while Luke is talking about the bloodline. Uh, the Messianic prophecies are quoted extensively in the, uh, in the uh, new uh, book of Matthew where Matthew is using their knowledge, the Jews' knowledge of Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming of Christ in order to be able to uh, uh, prove that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew goes into more detail as the teachings of Jesus and the events of his life. And I work for Jews. And I know that they are impressed with details. Matthew and Luke seem to have, have more parables presented in them because of the fact that uh, the Jews like to hear stories. And uh, I, I, I can remember several times while I was working with Jews, I would talk about something that happened in my life, and they became totally enhanced with what was happening. There's an outline that I have in there that I thought was interesting. I'm looking at the time. First of all, uh, if you want to, this is one outline that I saw that I, I really like. Uh, was that uh, Matthew's presenting the king. Uh, Matthew 1, 1 through 4, 11 deals with the idea of the presentation of the king. Now Matthew 4, 12 through 7, 29 in there. Deals with the idea of the, uh, of the proclamation of the king. Matthew 8, 1 through 11, 1 deals with the idea of the power of the king. Matthew uh, 11, 2 through 6, 12 deals with the progressive rejection of the king, where the Pharisees reject him. Uh, the uh, Matthew uh, 12, 13 through 20, 28 deals with the preparation of the king's disciples. Matthew 20 through 39 uh, through 27, 60 seals deals, deals with the presentation of the rejection of the king. And I like Matthew that chapter 28 deals with the proof of the king. Jesus Christ is king. He agrees with me. <laughs> One thought, Matthew 28, he ends his gospel with a command. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I wonder where the Pope stands with that. Jesus had the power. Jesus had the power. Then he tells us that go ye therefore into all nations, Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. One baptism by the authorization of the three names. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all, even unto the end of this world or age. That command is ours today. It has never been recalled. It has never been uh, taken from us. And our responsibility as Christians 
is to go into all the world, our world, unity, our own, and preach the gospel. Baptizing people into Christ that they might do what God wants them to do. If you've never done that, experience the blessing of God. If you need to be one of those that come, we ask that you believe, repent, confess, be buried with Christ in baptism. We're going to sing our song of invitation, hymn number 62, I think it is, just as I am. First verse only. You need to come. You invite you to come.